Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, what I will do uh, first uh, is introduce you to what Mechatronics is all about. So, I will talk about uh, my view of what the subject is, okay, as well as uh, tell you uh, happenings that are going on in IIT Bombay. So, that will be uh, one of the agendas and secondly to uh, uh, get you introduced to uh, some of the terms as well as some of the notions, concepts and tools that would be necessary for you to understand what the subject is about. I presume that most of you are, are new to mechatronics in the sense that you would have heard this buzzword floating around and you are here to figure out uh, what this is about. Okay, so that is my presumption and my lectures are based on that presumption. Okay, so let me get started off on these lectures. So, this is a slide that I use often uh, when I want to start lecturing on mechatronics. This is the first slide that I use, uh, especially to mechanical engineers, uh, uh, because it is something that they can relate to. Okay. Uh, if you see this, this slide, you have the this is a familiar flyball governor system that is used to regulate the speed of steam engines. Uh, I hope most of you are familiar with this. The idea is very simple. So, uh, if you look at the steam engine here, its job is to receive uh, the charge that is steam and in the process of expansion of the steam, it is able to drive through a turbine a shaft. Okay. And the shaft obviously is loaded by some mechanical load. Uh, we will not worry about that. Now, suppose I told you that you had to regulate the speed of this shaft. Okay. So, the, the objective is to regulate the speed of the shaft. Right. Uh, a popular solution that has been adopted has been around for 300, 400 years now. This is the Watts flyball governor. Okay. Uh, what this governor does uh, is the following. It senses the speed of the shaft okay, in a very peculiar fashion. Okay. Most people today would not do it this way. Uh, the position of these balls give you an indication of the speed of the shaft. The faster the shaft is, the balls move further apart. Okay. So, uh, you can think of the flyball governance shaft being coupled to this shaft and the position of these fly balls are then used to regulate how much steam goes in. Okay. In other words, suppose I want to regulate the uh, speed to a prescribed value okay. and uh, indeed, the shaft was rotating faster than that. Okay, so what an obvious uh, obvious thing that you would do is lessen the amount of charge that that goes into the steam engine, thereby reducing the the speed of the shaft. I mean, this is this is obvious. You don't need to be an engineer to know this. Okay. So how do you go about doing it? If you want to put less steam inside, okay, you open the steam valve by a smaller amount. Okay, that is also something that most people are, can appreciate. Okay, and the way it is done here is the position of the fly ball itself is used to actuate a series of linkages which closes uh, which closes or opens the valve. Is that clear? What happens? So you can you can imagine it. You your fly ball moves this way, and there is a set of linkages attached to the fly balls, which will open or close a valve. Okay, if it moves closer, it opens it. If it moves further apart, it closes it. Okay. Um, so, this is the speed regulation mechanism that is most popular in steam engines. In fact, all diesel engines even today in tractors use the governing mechanism very similar to this. Okay. So, it is a mechanical governing mechanism. Now, the reason I have taken, uh, I mean I, I talk about this example is first that it is easy to appreciate. You know how to regulate the speed of the shaft just by opening or closing a valve and you can think of it in mechanical terms. But there is something uh, more involved that I will be discussing. Uh, namely, uh, there is an observation here which is going to be critical to your study of mechatronics. If ever you are going to do a serious study of mechatronics, uh, you will have to pay attention to this observation I am going to make right now. Okay. Uh, the observation is as follows. There are two things that are happening here. Uh, one is that you need to decide based on the speed of the shaft, the main shaft that I have indicated here, you need to decide 
how much to close or open the valve by. Okay, that, that is a decision that needs to make, that you need to make, right? Okay. And coupled with that decision, in this case, is the actual job of moving it. Okay, so there are two things that are happening here. One is that the linkage mechanism is designed in such a fashion that if the fly balls move out by this much amount, then the valve is going to close by this much amount. Okay. Right. So the linkage mechanism is designed for the steam, uh, the, the steam valve to close by an appropriate amount if the fly ball governor goes in and out by a, a, a chosen amount. Okay. That decision is coupled with the actual job of moving it, moving the steam valve. Okay. So what do we mean by coupled? The same agent that makes the decision on how much to move by, which is the linkage mechanism, also does the job of moving it. Okay. So there is the, in this case, both the decision maker, the brains of the system and the uh, legwork is done by the same element, the set of linkage elements. Okay. Now this sort of a, this sort of uh, a characteristic of regulation of different variables of interest in mechanical systems uh, being done by the same agent responsible for both decision making and the leg work is very common okay, in non-mechatronic systems. Okay. So mechatronic systems are characterized by separating these two things where the decision making is separated from the job of actually doing it which is called actuation. Okay. So in philosophy even our human body works like that. The element that makes decisions is the brain. The brain does not actually go and move anything at all. The brain communicates uh, its decisions to different actuators which, you, which are the limbs, hands, legs of the body, fingers and the fingers are responsible for actually turning a screw for example. Right? It's not the it's it's not the brain that is actually turning the screw, but the brain provides the necessary information for the hands to behave in a certain fashion. Okay. So uh, this is the the observation that you probably need to digest. Most mechanical design, mechanical only designs, will have this feature that the decision making element and the power communication element are one and the same, physically. Okay. Now this, this uh, has uh, some advantages and, and lots of disadvantages, okay? that is the reason why we are into mechatronics now. Okay? If, you do this, uh, if you do this where the linkage in this case is both responsible for power transmission, okay? the physical job of moving something and it is also a computational element which decides how much to move by, then there is a severe limitation in the in the level of complexity that you can achieve. Okay, most of you who have done some course in kinematics of machinery or something like that, you would have done some linkage design, where I want a certain uh, tooth pa tool path to be traced by some end effector, and you decide the nature of the linkages, you know, and also the the interconnections between them, what kind of pairs you are going to use, etc. I'm I'm hoping most of you are familiar with what can be achieved through linkage design. Okay. So anybody that has done linkage design, at least on paper, will realize that you cannot get arbitrary motions that you want at the end. The motions that you get are severely constrained by the, 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 the linkages, their lengths, the kind of uh, joints you use, etc. Okay. What you get at, at the end effector right, cannot be arbitrary, first of all. Okay. Secondly, there is a problem of flexibility. So once you design a linkage, it's designed, right? If you want a different characteristic to appear at the end effector, then you have to redo the whole linkage design, okay? And you have to realize the linkage design differently, okay? So these two problems are very, very uh, severe in the cases where you want a single machine that is responsible for uh, orchestration of different tasks okay, to do some complex decision making as well as power transmission. Okay, so you lose out on computational complexity 
and you lose out on flexibility. Flexibility in the sense that if you want the same infrastructure to do a different task, you cannot do it if you have this, uh, this feature of both power transmission and computation being done by the same element okay? or it is severely limited the complexity that you can get. So, this observation forms the basis for why mechatronic systems have been built in the first place and are being built. Okay? So, mechatronic systems, uh, in mechatronic systems you will have, have this defining feature that through some process there is a separation of decision making from actuation. Okay? So, that is the design paradigm which is often called as mechatronics. Okay? So, it is it's not about putting some electronics in a mechanical system that is, that is the traditional view of it. I have some mechanical system and I put some electronics and now it is a mechatronic system. Right? So, uh, as opposed to that I think it is useful to think of mechatronics in this way as a design paradigm where decision making is separated from the job of actually doing something. Okay? And it has so happened that in the last 20-25 years because uh, electronic components have become cheap especially power amplification devices cheap as in as compared to what they were 50 years back. Right? So, there is a device that you will often find in a, in a mechatronic system which is doing some task of significance uh, called the power amplifier. Okay? And this power amplifier is in some sense uh, the heart of the system in the sense that it is what lets you separate decision making from the actual task of doing it. Okay? So, let me explain how that happens and hopefully this, this picture that is in front of you will make more sense once there is some clarity on what is happening. Okay. If you look at these components, this, this other components, computation, uh, operator interfaces, instrumentation, etc., all of them deal with the process of decision making. Okay. So, I, I will come to that, do not worry if you do not understand this, the, this slide just uh, offhand, you do not have to start noting down everything and you know this is not a, this is not a lecture that you will have to reproduce anywhere. Okay, so, uh, if you think of these elements as the decision making elements, right? so for example, the computation, the software that is sitting inside a microcontroller or an algorithm that is sitting inside a microcontroller is a, is a decision making body. Okay? Just because you know how to do something, it does not mean that the, that thing will get done. Okay? So, there has to be an execution body as well. Right? So, consider all this as decision making bodies and this actuation and this target system that responds in a certain fashion. They are the physical systems that need to be moved, that need to be uh, uh, supplied with some uh, hot steam or whatever it may be. They are the physical systems that you need to control. So, something has to happen in them. Okay? So, uh, that cannot happen if, uh, uh, if this device is not there, this yellow, uh, yellow colored device which is the amplifier. So, what the amplifier does is on one side of the amplifier you have all these devices that consume energy okay? that need energy for, for their existence or that need energy for them to do what they are supposed to do. Okay? And the, on the other side you have devices which make decisions, they also consume energy but very small amounts in, com in comparison to uh, the ones that I have uh, highlighted in the bottom here. Okay? So, let us again go back to the human brain and human system example. So, you have the human brain and you have the hands, these are the actuators okay? and this is the brain that is, that is responsible for making decisions. Okay? In between there is something, how, how does this thing start moving all of a sudden just because I tell it to move? So, no, the nervous system is the, is the answer. The nervous system only communicates decisions. Suppose you do not eat anything at all okay, for 5 days. If I ask you to run from here to there, you will take forever. Right? Your legs will not move. So, there is energy that is built up in the body because of uh, a, 
some ATP process happening where food is ingested and energy is stored in some molecules which are released when, when required. Okay. So, external energy is supplied okay, in, in, in our case through food ingestion which will help realize the decisions the brain wants to take. The nervous system does not move these things. Okay. It's, it's muscles, muscular, um, there is the muscles which is responsible for the motion and they need to be supplied with energy. Okay. So, it's a very similar thing, the power amplifier receives information okay, from, from the brain which is a computational element and it receives energy, which is the food from outside. Okay. And it moves these limbs which are the actuators. Now, you do not want to move the limbs just like that, right? You have to serve a purpose, you have to lift an object, you have to do something, right? So, lifting an, lifting an object, etc., the, the limbs are responsible for the lifting, but the object is the one that gets lifted and it has its own behavioral characteristics. For example, if you lift the object and, and drop it, it is going to fall down. So, that is the behavioral characteristic of, a, of an object like this wallet. Okay. But other, other objects that you are dealing with will have other behavioral characteristics. Okay. So, the actuators are responsible for dealing with the physical environment that you are in, interested in. Okay. Right. And the actuators get the energy from external food supply. Okay, and the brain is, the resp is responsible for making the decisions alone. Okay. Now, let us take a task of, uh, of picking up an object and putting it in some, some other place. So, I am picking this object and putting it here. Okay. Now, the actuators have energy and the brain is telling what the actuators what to do. But what is the brain making the decision based upon? Any answers? Yeah, but I want you to tell me in this case what is the brain making the decision based on on the on the eyes, right? So if, if I if I took my eyes out of this out of this uh, scheme of things, okay, I will find it difficult to put it here unless I know that it was already in this place. Okay, so suppose I move this table away and I don't have eyes, it will be very difficult for me to figure that I can put it here. Okay, so the the decision taken by the brain on where the hands need to go okay, is based on where it wants this thing to go and where it actually is, two things. Okay. So, where it wants it to go is only a job of the brain, you can code the brain to say that I want, to, I want it to go to a certain place, but where it actually is that the brain alone cannot do, you need the eyes. Okay, so, the eyes are the sensors, okay, they are responsible for telling the brain what is happening to the system that you are trying to influence. Okay. Now, this information that is communicated by the eye to the brain, there is, there is a little energy conversion, no physical process can really happen without some energy being transferred from one place to the other. The quantum of energy that is involved in this uh, in communication of the information of where do you, where does this stand to the brain is much lesser than the quantum of energy involved in actually lifting this object. Okay. So, that, so the, the sensor, the decision maker which is the computational element, these two elements along with uh, other elements that may be involved which I will briefly touch upon later, they do not consume significant amount of power they are responsible for communication of information. Okay. The actuators that the limbs and the physical thing that you are trying to control to influence them you need a substantial amount of power. Okay. So, there has to be an element in between which does the job of taking information and translating that into power. Okay. So, that is done by the power amplifier. It receives commands on what to do from the brain, it re receives food from the outside and actually does the job. All right. So, in all mechatronic systems you will have this device which is, which is the power amplifier which is responsible for 
uh, which allows you to separate decision making from actuation. And this has been made possible because of the growth of uh, power electronics okay, in the last 20, 30, 40 maybe years. Okay. And you, you, you can uh, communicate a significant amount of power, significant I am talking about hundreds of watts, possibly kilowatts, etc. through electronic means. Okay. So, the power amplifier will, will listen to uh, information from the brain only listen to that information, receive food from the outside and actually do the task. Okay, so, you will see a power amplifier in your uh, experimental setups that you will deal with in the afternoon. Okay. You will, so, the, it is not that the power amplifier is big or anything like that. Okay. So, do not think that something will be written saying power amplifier. So, you will, you will have to start looking for a power amplifier if you are talking about a mechatronic system that is doing some significant task. If it is not doing any task which requires a reasonable amount of power, you will probably have this device being replaced by something else. Okay. So, uh, so this, this picture that you see in front of you, uh, you know highlights what has already been said that of a feedback system. So, you have a power amplifier communicating power energy to this uh, to the limbs which impact the system of interest. What happens to the system of interest is sensed by a set of sensors communicated to a, a brain which is the computational device and the computational device impacts the, uh, the amplification process. Okay. So, it communicates what to do to the amplification process. Okay. So, uh, this, this design paradigm of separating decision making from actuation is what mechatronics is about and uh, after this I, I guess once you know, once you understand this design paradigm now, now there are some technology issues to understand that is how do you go about doing this it is one one thing to understand that you have to it is useful to separate decision making from actuation then there is a whole other thing for you to get involved with the technologies that will help you achieve a design of mechatronic systems where decision making is separated from actuation. Okay. So, a lot of what is what is going to be done uh, through this course as well as through the labs is to familiarize you with the technology involved in realizing this separating decision making from actuation. Okay. And there is no way to learn how to deal with a certain technology, but actually do it. You cannot learn mechatronics by uh, lying on the bed and reading a book, it is impossible. Okay. Because fundamentally there is only this idea beyond this is only a matter of your understanding of the physical system, your understanding of the technologies on and how to deal with the physical system, your understanding of electronics, your understanding of microcontrollers. Okay. And there is no way but to actually do it. If you, if you really want to learn how, how mechatronic systems are built, if you want to just get a flavor then this, this course will, will more or less do the job. Okay. So, any questions, if there are no questions, uh, what I will do is uh, I will give you a brief introduction to a couple of projects that I am involved with and show you, I mean there are a lot of elements in the project which do not directly uh, warrant this discussion, but I will point out to you where mechatronics fits in into them, right and just, just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that you could do or the kind of things that are happening out in the world. Uh, for you to place it in the context of separating decision making from actuation. Uh, I am going to give you a couple of examples, and then we are going to take a break and we will come back and start discussing uh, the structure of the computational element that is out there today. Okay. So, the predominant computational element are the uh, computational elements today are all digital computational devices. Okay. So, they are, they are built in a certain fashion for a certain reason. Okay. So, I am going to talk to you about the architecture of these computational devices and you are going to, you probably have seen some of them, you are going to see uh, a few more in the lab okay. and you hear these names all over the place every day, microcontroller, microprocessor, and, right. So, so part, of the, part of the agenda of this course is to demystify all this microcontroller, microprocessor business. Okay. It's, uh, so, uh, 
hopefully that will that will get through. So, I will talk to you about the structure of modern day computational devices. A specific question on the amplification of power modulation. Hmm. Uh, normally, you have no, no, amplification of power modulation. Or power yeah. Modulation. Or power hmm. modulation. Uh, normally, we see in electronics, right? It's uh, very easy to understand. But when I say amplification through mechanisms like uh, catalytics and uh, further, uh, say gearing also can give you. Amplification. So, do you see anything that is only pure mechanical amplification in the system? No, first of all, gearing doesn't give you amplification. The power on either side of the gear is the same, okay, if there is no frictional losses. No, I understand your question. Uh, the whole point of this, this, is, uh, this course is to say that there are certain tasks that are better done where the decision making is left to the electronics, okay, and you have power amplification devices which have to communicate with the, with, with the microcontrollers. So, they have to deal, deal with them with, in terms of voltages and currents. Okay. So, if, if you are going to have computational devices which are built based on electronic systems of today, then you will have to have power amplification devices that can communicate with those decision making bodies okay. and they have to be electronic in some sense because they have to deal with voltages and currents. Microcontrollers can only deal with voltages and currents at the end of the day. Okay. Now, your question of whether mechanical only amplification can happen, yes, sure, mechanical only amplification can happen. It happens all the time. Uh, before electronics existed, you could still do tasks. Uh, but the question is, the hybridization of amplification, hybrid amplification, like suppose if I drive a uh, flow controller, small flow diversion No, the hydraulic cylinder uh, forms this target system. So, you're, you want the uh, or this actuate, actuation system. The hydraulic cylinder gets information on what to do to a certain extent and also power from your flow control valve. It is not the actuator will not take external power. The actuator may take external power. For example, if you are driving motors, right? So, the external power comes through the power amplifier to the actuator. But if the motor is driving something else, okay, then that something else can take power from the outside world. There is nothing that prevents it. So, for, exa for example, in your case, a hydraulic power pack which is driven by a pump is responsible for, uh, for making sure that the cylinder actually moves. But it is how much it needs to move by etc. is orchestrated by a valve, flow control valve, which is again actuated by some solenoid actuated device prob probably. So, see, uh, we are not going to get into the specifics right away. Okay? Uh, neither am I ever going to discuss hydraulic system, the uh, minumatic system and things like that. Okay? So, so, if you understand the, the basic philosophy and the tools required for the synthesis of mechatronic system, it does not matter whether it is hydraulic or pneumatic. Okay, you have to deal with the specifics anyway. Okay. So, uh, nowhere in this course are you going to deal with, I am going to build a hydraulic system or I am going to build a pneumatic system. I, we are not going to do anything like that. Okay. You will probably be exposed to some, some uh, devices which are common in hydraulic systems, pneumatic systems, right? but you are, you are, we are not going to sit and synthesize anything only for hydraulics or only for pneumatics. Okay. So, we are going to look at things with a broader perspective and hopefully equip you with the uh, requisite tools for you to go and go ahead and do something okay or if for you to just get acquainted with what this is all about okay okay so i'm going to give you a couple of examples again by no means uh, covering the en entire gamut of areas where this mechatronic separating decision making from actuation idea applies I am only going to give you examples that I have been involved with. So, it is very parochial in its view, that is very local in its view, okay, but uh, will in some sense highlight what we have been talking about, okay, separating decision making from actuation. Okay. So, I will talk about two examples on, uh, on what is happening in the automobile industry. Okay. So, the automobile mechatronic boom as we speak is currently on. Okay, it has happened uh, in, in the machine tool industry since the late 80s or early 80s. Okay, the 
mechatronic boom in automobiles is beginning mid 90s i would say okay so progressively you see m more mechatronic solutions replacing traditional mechanical complexity okay so what do we mean by these huge words uh, traditional mechanical complexity for example you know the that there is something called the crankshaft in in most automobiles right internal combustion engines produce power they rotate a crankshaft okay now the crankshaft uh, the speed of the crankshaft is used to orchestrate a lot of things in the car i don't know if you're familiar with that for example when the valves need to move etc is determined uh, they have to go at half the speed of the crankshaft in a four stroke device etc there are a lot of things that are that are orchestrated based on what the crankshaft is doing okay or what speed it is rotating in now in the traditional mechanical mechanical only world you used uh, different pulleys and and possibly linkages uh, cam operated etc to translate the motion of the crankshaft so you take power from it as well as communicate the desired motion to different devices okay through mechanical only means okay this stuff is soon disappearing okay so in in 10 years down the line if you are uh, if you look at a at a vehicle you will see uh, a lot of things that you don't currently see in automobiles okay right so uh, so this mechatronic boom uh, has led to a lot of effort over the last 15 20 years and also now in getting mechatronic ideas into in, into automobile space okay so i'm going to discuss two things two projects that i have been involved with which have which do essentially the same thing replace mechanical complexity with mechatronically controlled solutions okay so these two projects is what i will i will describe okay so the global trend like i mentioned uh, is that you want to replace mechanical complexity complexity with uh, intelligent mechatronic solutions and the perceived benefits i have already all kind of spoken about you have reconfigurability that's the flexibility in the design uh, in many cases better vehicle handling in many cases cheaper okay because you don't you don't need physical mechanical parts that are expensive to make decisions okay uh, and in some case reduce driver fatigue etc there are lots of uh, lots of advantages that the driver as well as the automobile industry is really interested in uh, it doesn't make sense to do this everywhere but it it makes sense to do, do this for certain certain subsystems okay so i will talk about two of such uh, two such problems now i will talk about the this problem first because i think it's people are more familiar with this <coughs> so i will uh, so i don't know how many of you have heard of this term engine management system uh, for automobiles some of you may have heard it it's a, it's a buzzword it doesn't mean anything by itself okay i manage the engine right uh, so most people who have driven two two wheelers or even the older four wheelers will know that there is something called the carburetor in it now you see automobile mechanics fiddling with some screws in some carburetor uh, cleaning the carburetor okay whether you know whether you have actually seen it or not you have heard somebody talking about the carburetor okay now the carburetor's job is to mix air and fuel okay this carburetors are used in gasoline engines that is petrol powered engines its job is to mix air and fuel when you uh, move your throttle in your in your bike what you are doing is letting in more air when you open it the carburetor mixes an appropriate amount of fuel and provides it to the engine okay now i have to give you a story first before you understand what may where mechatronics fits into all of this okay so you have to listen to the story otherwise you are going to lose the plot so the carburetor is responsible for mixing air with fuel and communicating a combustible mixture not all mixtures of air and fuel will combust okay for combustion you need oxygen that's why you're putting in air and it gives a combustible mixture to the cylinder so inside the cylinder what happens is that you first take in the combustible mixture you compress the combustible mixture raising its internal energy and then you ignite the combusted mixture oh sorry the compressed mixture when you ignite a com compressed mixture is like a bomb so it explodes and in the process of the explosion you communicate energy to the piston 
and which is taken through the linkage mechanism that you would have solved 100,000 times to the crankshaft. Okay, so that's the slider crank mechanism. Okay, then once it once the mixture has been combusted, what is left there is of no use, so you have to throw that out. So you put it out into the exhaust. Okay, and then take another uh, ingest another combustible mixture. Okay, so this is what happens in an internal combustion engine. Okay, so I just describe what happens in a gasoline engine. So there is a fuel air mixture preparation. There is ingestion into the engine, compression followed by ignition and exhaust. Okay, so these are these are usually these strokes can can be physically separate in a four-stroke engine or kind of mixed in a two-stroke engine. Okay. So uh, this process has been going on in in cars in in the West until the late 80s. Almost all cars were carbureted. In India, until 1999, 97, sort of, all cars were carbureted. Since then, all cars in India since 1998, as well as the cars in the West since 1987-88, have all been are, are all fuel injected vehicles. Okay, fuel inject injection means the the nature of the mixing of air with fuel is different. So the carburetor is thrown out. There is no carburetor in fuel injection vehicles. Okay. So you move a throttle. So as throttle is just like a valve. It will let, let in air if you open it. Close if you don't open it. Okay. So that is what you are controlling when you are doing this. And depending on how much air comes inside, you inject a certain quantity of fuel. In the case of the carburetor, the mixing happens because of some complicated venturi shape that exists inside. Okay, you know that if you have a, a convergent area, okay, velocities increase if you are operating below sound, speed of sound okay. and because velocity increases, the pressure decreases. Because the pressure decreases and you, if, you, if you connect a vent to the, uh, to the fuel line, fuel is going to get sucked in because fuel there is at atmospheric and this will be less than atmospheric. Okay, this is how a carburetor works. It's a very complicated mechanical device. Lots of holes here and there, and that need to be. This has to be plugged in screws here. So it's a. It has evolved into a highly complex mechanical device. So if you start di dissecting a carburetor today, you won't understand what is happening inside that. Okay. Uh, so the story is that most cars, uh, not most cars, all cars sold today are fuel injected cars. Okay. Uh, but all bikes sold today are carbureted bikes. Now, why do you need fuel injection? Why do you want to move to fuel injection? The main reason is that you can accurately meter the amount of fuel that you can put in. Okay. So, in the carburetor, it just happens that a certain amount of fuel is taken in. Okay. And the, and the decision on how much fuel to take, take in is coupled with the mechanical design, with the, coupled with the process of actually taking in that fuel. It is the same problem that, you, that existed with uh, with the watts governor, fly ball governor. How much fuel to take inside is coupled with the job of actually taking that much fuel inside through the mechanical design of the carburetor. Okay? As opposed to a fuel injection system where the decision on how much fuel needs to be put inside is taken by usually a, an electronic device, a computational device and the job of actually putting in that much fuel is orchestrated by a solenoid controlled injector. Okay? So, the, the computational device tells the solenoid open and the solenoid opens, tells the solenoid close, solenoid closes. The energy for opening and closing comes from the outside world, it is a food. Okay. And in the process of opening and closing, you can accurately meter fuel going into the cylinder. Okay. Now, what is the use of accurately metering fuel going into the cylinder is because you are worried more and more about the emissions that come out of the tailpipe. If you do not accurately meter fuel, the devices that, that a lot of people uh, have started talking about since 1990s, I guess, in India, catalytic converters, they do not work well if you do not make them operate in a certain region of operation. So, it is important that what goes into the catalytic converter has a certain composition. And that composition cannot be maintained if you, know, if you do not accurately control the fuel. Okay, so, this is the whole story of why you have moved away from carburetion to, uh, to fuel injection system. Okay. And we have just replicated this story for bikes. 
Okay, so group in IIT Bombay that I have been involved with uh, has built a fuel injected bike that gives certain emissions and fuel economy etc. Uh, and the fundamental idea there is to replace the mechanical complexity in the carburetor with electronically controlled fuel injection solutions. Okay. So, this picture, so that is the story, this picture uh, describes uh, what, what happens in a typical electronically controlled fuel injection solution. Okay. All right. This, these blue lines that you see here, can you, you can see blue and red, right? Yeah. The blue lines you see there are decisions that are taken by the computational device. Okay. So, what decisions do you expect the computational device to take? If you have to drive a vehicle, what decisions do you think the computational device has to take? No. Speed of the vehicle is a resu result of throttle opening is the driver's job. If the de computational device is taking that, yeah, what do you mean by fuel injection? How much fuel to inject and when to inject okay? and when to spark. Okay? These are the usual decisions that are taken by, uh, yeah. What you mentioned is, uh, is also comes in, in, in what are known as drive by wire throttle systems, uh, where the throttle opening of the driver is not exactly replicated all the time. Okay? So, there is some element in between which will decide. Uh, how, how much the throttle really needs to be opened by? Should it be opened by the what the driver demands or should it be opened lesser or more? Okay. But most of the time that is not there. So, you have a fuel injection, uh, fuel in injector needs to be told how much uh, fuel needs to be injected and that is decided by the amount of time you are going to keep the fuel line open. Okay. And when, when to inject is also important and when to spark. Okay. So, these decisions are made by the computational device. They are communicated to power amplification devices individually. So, the fuel injector is going to be, the solenoid is going to be drive, driven by a fuel injector driver, okay, so power amplification device and similarly the spark plug. So, you can decide when to spark, but actually the spark has to be produced okay, uh, at pretty high voltages for the sparking action to happen. Right? You need to maintain a high voltage over a very small distance. Okay, so, that is what is happening in a spark plug. And so, this, this job of actually producing high voltages etcetera is done by external circuitry which receives the command on when to spark. Okay. Uh, so, these blue lines indicate, indicate that the decisions on of the controller or, or the decisions of the computational device. The red lines indicate the pieces of information it re requires to make those decisions. Okay. Remember that the computational device only deals with information. It will it will deal with feedback information that is uh, information on what what is actually happening in the system and it already has an idea of what it wants to happen in a system. Okay. And based on these two uh, based on comparisons it decides what the system should do right now. Okay. So, the, these sort of arguments are common in feedback control design. So, uh, the pieces of information it makes its decisions based on, okay. uh, one is you need to know where the piston is uh, with respect to its stroke because you need to spark at an appropriate point so that you, you produce enough power. Okay. So, the crank position is important, crank speed is also important because you make decisions based on, on that. Okay. I, I will not be able to go into the details of, of that right now. Okay. Uh, one, uh, one piece of information that you may, you may not know if you are not exposed to automobile systems is that uh, cars of, in, in cars you have a sensor called the exhaust gas oxygen sensors. Okay. So, that measures the amount, relative amount of air to the amount of fuel that exists in the exhaust gas that comes out. Okay. Now, the whole point of fuel injection actually revolves around this, this uh, uh, this technology in, in some sense that if you can measure what comes out then you can suitably change what goes inside such that the measured value is equal to some desired value. Okay. 
So, I'll like I briefly to, told, talk to you about catalytic converters. Okay. So, I will just uh, show you a picture of uh, the efficiency of conversion of harmful pollutants into less harmful ones by the catalytic converter. Okay. So, what, what comes out of the uh, out of the exhaust? What is there in the exhaust? Yeah. So, what? So, so you have to worry about what what is fuel composed of? It's carbon and hydrogen molecules with some additives. Then you have oxygen to, and nitrogen because you cannot just supply uh, pure oxygen. You are taking in air. Okay. So, if you burn all this, you will you will produce species which use these as elements: carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Okay. So, the species are mainly carbon dioxide and water. Okay. If you combust a hydrocarbon like butane, octane, you will get carbon dioxide and water. But you also get other things because the com uh, combustion is not complete, you get carbon monoxide. You also get unburnt hydrocarbons, things uh, different hydrocarbons which, which are produced as a result of breaking off octane for example. Then because the temperatures are high, you get nitrogen and oxygen combining. Nitrogen is usually an inert element. Okay, that is the reason we are surviving. But uh, if you raise the temperatures uh, beyond a certain point, okay, this will not happen due to global warming, but it will happen at very high temperatures. Then nitrogen and oxygen will combine to produce oxides of nitrogen, which are called nitrogen oxides. So, the laughing gas is one oxide, okay, so N2O, NO, nitric oxide. So, all these things come out of the tailpipe, uh, oh sorry, uh, come out of the engine. Okay. Now, the automobile industry does not consider carbon dioxide as, as a pollutant at all. Okay. It considers carbon monoxide because carbon monoxide is a lethal gas, so is a really highly dangerous gas. If I, if I put you in a carbon monoxide chamber, you will die in 2 minutes. Okay. So, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, unburnt hydrocarbons which are uh, bad for alveoli and lungs. Okay, and uh, nitrogen oxides, which are also bad for other reasons. You know, these are considered as harmful pollutants. Okay, so, the emission norms are, reg are regulated based on what these harmful pollutants have to do. Okay, so, uh, what, you, what you want ideally is these harmful pollutants, carbon monoxides, unburnt hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides should be kept within the emission limits. Okay, and those are getting stricter and stricter. So, the what comes out of the tailpipe needs to be lesser and lesser in terms of these harmful emissions. If you produce more carbon dioxide, it is okay for now. Okay. So, uh, what comes out of the engine is not what comes out of the tailpipe. There is some device in between, okay, which is called the catalytic converter and its conversion efficiencies work this way. The plot that is shown here is hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide conversion efficiency. So, what do you convert them to? Carbon monoxide is converted into carbon dioxide. Okay, nitrogen oxide is con converted into nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, hydrocarbons again converted into carbon dioxide and water. Okay, see th these are considered less harmful. So, how efficiently you convert them depends on the conversion efficiency of the catalytic converter. Okay. Now, the if there is more oxygen, more air Okay, then it is easy to combust the carbon monoxide and the hydrocarbon okay, and produce carbon dioxide and water. If there is, but unfortunately if there is more air, nitrogen oxides will not get reduced to nitrogen and oxygen. You know reduction is taking away oxygen and oxidation is putting in oxygen, right? some chemistry, basic, basic chemistry. So, it so happens that these catalytic converters because they use noble metals as catalysts, the conversion efficiencies of all these three things are maximized in a very tight region around the uh, around stoichiometry. So, I will not get into that. That is the appropriate amount of um, air that has to be mixed with the fuel for it to burn properly. Okay. Now, for that reason, you need to maintain what comes out of the air fuel mixture to appropriate amounts. Okay. So, the air fuel ratio of the mixture coming out of the engine should be kept very close to stoichiometry and that is the reason why you need fuel injection because fuel injection allows you to meter 
fuel properly, okay, accurately, not pro I shouldn't say properly. Now, what comes out of the exhaust needs to be sensed. That is, you, like just like you need your eyes to say where this is. You need to know what air, air fuel ratio actually comes out so that you can make decisions based on the difference between what actually comes out and what what you want. Okay, and that is sensed by a sensor called the exhaust gas oxygen sensor, which gives you an indication of whether there is more fuel or more oxygen. Okay. All right. So one example where uh, this mechatronic idea of separating decision making from actuation, the idea there is to throw out the carburetor and put a fuel injection solution because you can ac accurately meter fuel and the decision of may how much to fuel to put in is separate from the decision of actually putting that uh, from the job of actually putting that in okay which is unlike the carburetor okay i am going to give, talk about another example uh, this is also a project that we have been involved with this is uh, with with regard to steering system of an automobile okay you know the job of the steering system is what is the job of the steering system in an automobile is to maneuver the vehicle along a trajectory desired by the driver okay and you are familiar with automotive steering systems that have this hand wheel and you do this and the vehicle starts moving around right so the the steer, steering systems of today come in a lot of flavors okay, you must have heard of power steering where your, the effort that you need to put in is reduced okay so what i'm going to talk to you about a steer by wire that is there is no there is no mechanical interconnection between the hand wheel and the road wheels unlike power steering power steering still has mechanical interconnection in a steer by wire system so you have uh, so on the left here is a traditional mechanical mechanical system okay and on the right here you have a steer by wire system just a picture of or a you know a schematic of that where all this mechanical complexity in between the hand wheel and the road wheels is is replaced by mechatronic solutions okay so what do we mean by mechatronic solution so just think of it along the lines that we have been talking about right now so in the job of steering a vehicle there are two things involved one is the driver needs to communicate how much the wheels need to move by that is a decision the other is actually doing the job of moving the wheels so there are two things that are happening okay in a mechanical only not even power steering system this both these are coupled because of the linkages okay whereas in a in a by wire system or steer by wire system the decision on how much to move the wheels by is separated from actually moving the wheels so there is the um the, the driver communicates what the trajectory needs to be okay and and what each of the wheels need to move, move by is decided by a controller okay and the actual job of moving the controller or moving the wheels is done by actuators which are motor motors that are driving it okay now again what you are doing here is your traditional mechanical complexity in a steering system uh, it's pretty complex if you look at a steering system it is uh, it communicates to the wheel through some set of linkages which are bouncing around when the wheels go up and down okay so they are, they are not simple linkages there are actually a lot of spherical joints involved there okay so uh, the the complexity in a in a steering system of today is i mean it's not the most complex part in an automobile but it is complex okay so uh, that being replaced by uh, a, a solution where you uh, replace this mechanical complexity by electronically controlled solutions okay now why would you want to do it i will briefly mention what the advantages of uh, doing that are uh, one of the one of the touted benefits is that in the event of a front because you don't have a steering column at all now in a steer by wire vehicle there is no steering column there is nothing that no rod that goes okay so you this can be a toy you can place it anywhere in the car Okay, you can see literally sit in the back seat and drive okay now so since you don't have a steering column in the event of a front end collision most people die because the steering column juts into their face 
okay. So, you have this this advantage that the steering column will not, there is no steering column, so it will not get into your face. Uh, that is what is called passive safety, okay. So, advantage of passive safety. Secondly, the amount of effort that you need to put in to drive a vehicle goes down. It can be literally be driven by a by a child, okay. So, you can drive it with a single finger. Uh, so, that is a benefit that come, these are benefits that come for passengers or drivers of the vehicle. The benefits that go to the automobile industry are that there is no difference between a left hand drive and a right hand drive now. The same set of components can, you just need to take this user interface and put it on this side, ok. So, uh, that is a benefit for the automobile industry. Secondly, the many of the mechanical uh, components being done away with, you do not have, uh, you do not, it, it, it is possibly a saving on, uh, on costs of fabrication, ok. So, that is a also a touted benefit. And lastly, you can make the vehicle do things that it usually does not do because now you have sometimes independently controlled wheels. So, your uh, hand handling in emergency situations is better or at least you can exploit the benefit. So, there are several touted benefits of steer by wire ok and uh, we have been involved with building, building a steer by wire vehicle here. So, let me uh, briefly uh, tell you how steer by wire works. Mm, maybe this picture, ok. On the handwheel side, you have something that communicates how much the, the road wheels need to move by, ok. So, the handwheel communicates information on what the driver really wants to a controller which makes the decision on what the road wheels have to do, ok. The actual job of moving the road wheels is done by uh, actuators. I do not think you can see much of it over here, uh, but just to get a sense all this is these shots, the bottom two shots are from below the vehicle, ok. So, the these are actuators that physically move this, uh, the last set of steering linkages to move the road wheel, ok. The actual job is done by, uh, by these motor driven actuators and the decision on how much they need to move by is di dictated by computational devices, ok. So, I will not get into the details of this too much. I just wanted to give you a flavor that what we are talking here is not in not in air. It is not like a, it is not that something is happening, mechatronics kuch to kar rahe, you know. So, all these things are really going on in the world and it is the more that you are familiar with it, if you are a decision maker, you will be able to make decisions on whether to go with this sort of design paradigm or not, ok. And if you are a person who is actively involved in building mechatronic systems, you have to know this philosophy or, or interested in getting involved. And uh, lastly, if you are an instructor in a college, uh, a, because you have a an unwritten job of training the next generation of students with, with necessary tools to deal with the world that they will see. I think this is this is a requisite for a program that is that is the, or out there today. Okay, so uh, for all these three uh, categories of people, this is important. Okay. This is a question that everybody asks, ok. Uh, I am, I am, I suppose that you are referring to steer by wire. Have you ever taken a plane, aircraft? No, ok. Uh, so, what happens in a, in a flight is that everything is by wire, ok. The faith that the plane flies, you know, you are not exposed to this because nobody tells you it is by wire, ok. The reason the pl plane flies today is is the the actuators are all controlled by wire or the way it flies the way it flies today is is by wire. It was not like that in the early 40s, 50s. Um, the same issues happen there. You know uh, the the same question of safety comes in there. Okay. The aircraft industry has had the opportunity to develop the solution over a period of time, okay, 20, 30 years, and also they have the advantage of putting redundant actuators. 
something fails then you have some something else to take care of okay so your question is very valid in the automotive industry you will need some time for maturing this technology there is no steer by wire vehicle on the road today no steer by wire car okay um, and uh, the issue of safety and providing redundancy is a genuine concern in fact that is the most important concern why this technology has not yet come out on the road but it is going to be resolved soon sooner or later okay in another 5 10 years i think you will see some higher end cars having steer by wire technology but it is a genuine concern uh, but the answer that i have always is that of is it is that of the plane you don't question whether the plane is safe okay if you look at statistics air uh, air travel is one of the safest means of travel okay the fact that if something goes wrong everybody dies is the only deterrent but if you just look at number of air crashes in a year to the number of hours flown it is much safer than walking on mumbai roads okay so that has been made possible i mean steer by wire technology works there so if you put in a, the requisite effort it should work here also so that's that's my answer but uh, there are a lot of inputs that are required for that to happen first of all unlimited money that went into the aircraft industry is not there here so there are there are several concerns but that is a genuine concern for steer by wire No, no, no. So basically, uh, <laughs> this. So what happens? There is a lag. Uh, say when you want to make a sharp turn, it is possible in a vehicle. When we doubt about the the time, the, the lag, you know, or basically phase difference between your turning of the vehicle versus that uh, turning of the wheel. So just time we are generating mechanical doubts, nothing else. When particularly you are handling a bad road or very large potholes and whatnot, then the failure may chances are chances of failure as well as. The power back required because this wire system is needed a constant source of electrical power. If it fails, then we have again a requirement of redundancy there also. So that makes system very complicated. That's what we presume. No, no, the presumptions are wrong. Uh, the first of all, the the analogy with with an aircraft. Aircraft is not doing some. It's not static. It's doing lots of things that you don't know about. That's how well it is designed. Okay. Uh, in fact the play the pilot is not flying it for most of the time except for landing and take off right and if you look at the uh, the surface envelopes on the side they are doing lots of things when you are flying the aircraft and about different conditions etc i think it is more severe in the case of the aircraft industry they go from uh, zero mean sea level right up to 40000 feet air is rarefied to about 0.4 0.5 okay times what what is what it is here so they are constantly doing this day in and day out they can fly through th thunderstorms they can they can land in all sorts of weather so i mean I, i think there is no comparison between the complexity there and here uh, but at the same time the main issue here is to be able to realize a, a, a by wire solution which is cost effective you know you don't have you don't have the flexibility in an automobile to put all sorts of redundancy that you you would want uh, uh, in place so the the main challenge is actually cost effectiveness it is not so much whether it can it can navigate about the electric power pack failing i mean it's again it's a question of reliability the, the so have you encountered a, a vehicle uh, a car today you know, that fails because there is no uh, no fuel going into it the number of such occurrences actually is far lesser than what it used to be earlier these are all fuel injected uh, cars okay and they are all driven by electric power packs in some sense okay so just because it's electrical it doesn't mean that it is less less reliable okay uh, it it all depends on the on the design of the of the system itself and just because it is it is mechanical also it doesn't mean that it is bad so you you will need to judiciously use both of these things okay so you know uh, lambasting one set of uh, technology tools over the other is doesn't make sense i mean it depends on what you're what you're trying to do you know but certainly the notion that electrical systems are are less reliable than mechanical systems is not true yeah so uh, uh, 
that's one thing that possibly you need to get out of. Just because a mechanical system is big, it doesn't mean it will be robust and you know take care of take care of eventualities. My question is based on the implementation issues. Now, how far your I mean your efforts in implementing this in practical commercial industries are successful? I have not implemented anything commercially, but the process is on. Both these vehicles are running. First of all. Okay. So, uh, I'll be very happy if you are getting positive uh, uh, feedback from the industry as far as the research is being implemented in the industry. See, none of this stuff can be done without the industry being involved. Okay. So, uh, um, I will just say that uh, a company has been floated to take this into, uh, into commercialization. Okay. Uh, but this question of research ideas getting into the uh, into commercial utility this has been on for ages including the west what happens in the west it doesn't mean that anything that happens in the lab goes out into the market okay wait one let me finish okay besides that i think that that kind of derails this, this discussion on on mechatronics itself so if you are interested in having a having a chat on whether this is going to get commercialized or not you talk to the guy behind sitting behind you or you can come and talk to me some sometime else okay Okay?